Guy Vanderhaeg once described himself as a bookish prairie boy who often lost himself in games of cowboys and Indians, or in a book like Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. He still lives in Saskatchewan where he turns out beautifully crafted stories that win him international prizes and avid fans. Timothy Finley says Vanderhaeg is a writer who has plundered the language for all its treasures. It is my pleasure to welcome Guy Vanderhaeg, writer and plunderer, back to Studio 4 to tell us more. <laughs> Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Guy Clarence Vanderhaeg from yes. Saskatchewan. That's right. How many generations? Um, actually, uh, one of my great-grandfathers came out before the Real Rebellion, so he, mm. was, he was there in, in 1883. Really? And my, my, uh, on the Belgian side of the family, uh, my grandfather came out uh, shortly before the First World War. Any chance they were writers? Any of them? Absolutely no chance whatsoever. Not a chance. <laughs> Who taught you to write? I don't think anybody taught me to write, but I grew up in a very strong oral storytelling mm. tradition. And my mother's family uh, were, were full of, ra or was a lot of raconteurs, uh, people who could craft a story on the fly. Uh, and I, I listened very carefully mm -hmm. to all of them. You know, I was talking to a Canadian comedian, Ron James, recently, and we were worried, but the two of us, mm -hmm. with nothing to base this on, that Canada was running out of characters and we're running out of storytellers. Not writers, but oral storytellers, around the, around the table storytellers who we grew up with. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as a country becomes more urban, mm -hmm. that almost naturally happens. Uh, but, you know, if you grow up in a small town, you, you know who the storytellers are, and the storytellers often have a certain cachet, they have a certain pride in being able to craft mm -hmm. a story on the fly. Um, and uh, they're appreciated. Mm -hmm, for sure. When did you turn to writing full time? You were a school teacher, library assistant, a few things. Never herded pigs, did you? Uh, no, no, I never herded <laughs> pigs, <Okay>. unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, so when did you know that writing full-time was a thing? When it, for success? Uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to be a full-time writer, but I never expected to become a full-time mm. writer. And I, I had actually resigned myself to the fact that uh, writing was a nasty habit or addiction that I would have to support. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I probably worked until I was 45 mm. at... You Just know, in case. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I exactly. I mean, I, 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 I couldn't have gotten by without, without doing other kinds of But didn't of work. your first book, uh, Man Descending, was the short story book? Right. Was that the yeah. short story book? It won the Governor General's Award. Yes. That's a good sign. That's a, that's a good sign, but, you know, short stories don't sell very well. Right. Um, and I think, you know, in this country, perhaps it's changing a bit. It takes time to build an audience. You, you, you know, you have to write a number of books until you become recognizable as a name or that you mm. collect readers. Um, Hollywood calls. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood's never called. No, but yeah, TV yeah, is yeah, called, yes, exactly. Englishman's Boy, yeah. and wanted to uh, make your, uh, certainly some of the Western book, the two last, how many are there, three? There's three, right. So Last Crossing, Engl I mean, Englishman's Boy, Last, last crossing, crossing, and now this one. Right. A Good Man. Tell me about it. Uh, what I guess the real question is piqued your interest in uh, uh, General Custer and uh, Fort Benton and Sitting Bull and the Sioux and that period and all of the above. Well, I mean, I, I was very interested in the personal relationship between Sitting Bull and Major James Morrill Walsh. Mm -hmm. um, when Sitting Bull crossed the border into Canada after the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, Walsh was kind of charged with keeping an eye on him, uh, and Walsh actually... And reporting to the Americans, I'm assuming. Well, in, in part, but also sort of under the direction of the, the, the Canadian government. The Canadian government did not want to sue on Canadian territory because they knew that there were a possi you know, possibility of cross-border raids, uh, which would annoy the Americans. Secondly, they didn't want to give Indians that they considered not Canadian Indians a reservation mm. or to provide rations for them. Um, and Walsh kind of walked a tightrope uh, in terms 
of he wanted uh, the, the, the government to give the Sioux um, certain protections and support and help, which got him into trouble. Uh, so I started out with that as an idea, but as I began investigating things, sort of doing research, it took me very far afield uh, because uh, in, inve in looking at Walsh's life, I discovered that he had been an officer in the Canadian militia, that the Canadian militia had been defeated in a battle called the Battle of Ridgeway by the first Irish Republican army. Uh, then, then that Hence led me... Hence come the Irish. Yeah, and, th and then uh, th that led me uh, to doing research on the first Canadian secret police. Uh, so it started with, with Walsh and Sitting Bull, but I got mm -hmm. carried... In. Into the uh, Northwest Mounted Police and then the secret police? Right. Right, and so when you call it a good man, who was, the, I guess you're not going to answer this question. Yeah, quite likely not. <laughs> Probably, not. Probably not. We'll figure out who a good man was. And the, the Ottawa connection and the politics and back and forth and uh, some romance, of course. Mm -hmm. Always one. Always mm -hmm. romance. Always romance and a little illicit. Yeah. A little illicit. Yeah. She was a widow, wasn't she? Yes. We won't give it away. Yeah. Right. That would be cruel. Yes. An unusual punishment. <laughs> Yes. Uh, when you write, Saskatchewan always, or can you write, I ask Ian Rankin this question, can you write anywhere or do you have a ritual routine? I have a ritual r routine. I can't write on the road. Uh, I just find it impossible. So I, you know, I do all my writing uh, at home and I get up very early in the morning uh, when the phone isn't ringing. Uh, and I think partly, I, you know, I was saying when we were driving down here and talking about these kinds of things, I think I was imprinted like a gosling, very young, <laughs> because I was the, you know, a farmer's son. Mm -hmm. uh, so now that I've reached a certain age and don't sleep very well, it's best for me to get up at four in the morning and, and go to work then. And what part of the prairies still call to you deeply? I uh, infuse you. I, I, Actually, there, there are two regions. I mean, one is the, the, the parkland uh, where I grew up on the eastern side near the Manitoba border. Mm -hmm. And then my adopted territory, because my, my wife came from that southwestern corner of Saskatchewan that I've been doing a lot of writing about, very near Cypress Hills. Um, and m my brother-in-law was an amateur archaeologist, and he could take me out and show me stone effigies mm -hmm. like the Cabri Man, uh, Cabri Man uh, teepee rings on the, the on top of the hills, a buffalo jumps where you mm. know the, the the bones were so thick that there'd be just like a, a chalky white streak in in a in a in a cut bank. So uh, my childhood memories are of a different landscape, sort of mm -hmm. the, the Quapel Valley, where my father had, right. had, a, had, had, a, had a farm, and then the more arid... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way of putting yeah, it. Right. <laughs> uh, you speak truth, Sitting Bull. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, welcome back with Guy Vanderhaeg, his uh, third work in the trilogy, first The Last Crossing and The Englishman's Boy, A Good Man.